Well, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be back. Uh, I say back, but it's been a long time since I've been. But as Hassan said, once a year we hold our, hold our board meetings outside of Ottawa, and this year we chose Whitehorse, and what a great choice it's been. Um, I would like to say hello to our board members who span the country from coast to coast. Hassan, of course, uh, you've just met from, uh, from the west coast, uh, from Vancouver. Phyllis Clark is out here. I can't see anybody because the lights are really bright. There's Phyllis. She's from Edmonton. And Greg Stewart, who isn't here this evening, is in Regina. Alan Borger uh, from Winnipeg. I like Don Allen. Claire Kennedy from Toronto and uh, Wes Scott from Toronto, and then Monique, uh, Monique uh, Jérôme Forget from Montreal, and uh, Jean Simon also from Montreal, and then Norman Betts from Fredericton. There we are. Colin Dodds from Halifax. There he is, and Derek Key from Summerside, right up front here. Martin Sullivan from St. John's, and of course our Senior Deputy Governor, Carolyn Wilkins, is up here at the front. That's our board of directors. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here and see the land of the midnight sun firsthand. I can tell you that the last time I was here, I was with EDC and I forget exactly what year it was, but the, the locals convinced me to come up to give a talk and it was mid-January uh, because they promised that I would see the northern lights. It was supposed to be one of those great years to come up and see the lights. And the only problem was it snowed the whole time I was here. So I didn't see the lights then, and I didn't see them now, except there's a lot of light going on in the middle of the night here. Uh, but it's uh, not great to see White Horse in the daylight, because I hardly saw it uh, the last time. So visits like these really supplement the work that are done uh, by people like Callista, uh, our regional staff, keep us on top of things going on on the ground to, by talking to people who actually make the economy tick. And our board spent the entire day today, and of course uh, yesterday, uh, hearing from local business leaders. And last evening we had dinner with Chief Doris Bill, which was a very impactful evening. So some of our board members actually had a little holiday before the meeting, uh, doing the, uh, the hiking and a little fishing. I saw some pictures which prove it. So, and the one that got away was massive, of course. But, uh, Anyway, I don't have to tell you that the Canadian economy has faced its share of challenges these past few years. And our exports absolutely plunged in the wake of the global financial crisis. And we lost many exporting companies and their jobs. The global recovery since 2010 has been disappointing. And so has our export recovery. Well, for a while there, high oil prices boosted Canada's income growth and increased investment in the energy sector. And that lasted through 2014, and that helped offset some of this bad news. But over the past 18 months, that growth engine, too, has throttled back. So today, in Canada, we find ourselves partway through two distinct economic narratives. First, the resource economy. It's going through a painful and complex adjustment to lower prices. It's an adjustment that will take income levels lower, it's gonna take investment lower, it's gonna mean lower employment, as well as implying the migration of families within Canada. A very long process that will take another couple of years to work itself out. The second narrative is that the non-resource economy is still healing from the post-crisis trauma. It's moving unevenly toward full capacity, two steps forward with one step backward, and that's how it goes. But then on top of all this, we have the wildfires in northern Alberta, which uh, devastated the town of Fort McMurray, forced some 90,000 people from their homes, and of course have affected production in the oil sands. So this has added a ch uh, another challenge to a situation that was already very difficult. But through all this, the one constant in recent years has been the Canadian consumer. Thank you very much, by the way. <clears throat> in part supported by low interest rates, Canadian consumers have been a steady source of economic growth, especially in the housing sector. The result? Well, Canadian households today are carrying near record debt loads. 
and we're growing increasingly concerned about risks in some housing markets. So by now you might be wondering just how is Canada really doing in the face of all these conflicting economic forces. So today what I thought I'd do is to offer you a progress report. And let me say this at the outset. We are making progress. Now four times a year, the bank publishes its monetary policy report. I encourage you all to read it. It's called the MPR. And that contains our latest projections for the Canadian economy. Now our model-based forecasts are also supplemented with a lot of judgment. And that judgment is supported by extensive consultations with companies and other contexts. Conditional on this economic projection though, what we can do is choose a path for interest rates. And that path will keep projected inflation on our target. Or bring it back to target, if it's not on target, over a reasonable time frame. Now at the end of each of these MPRs, we highlight several risks to the forecast. These are issues that require the Governing Council to exercise judgment. Now, in principle, if one of those risks were realized, projected inflation would deviate from our target, and an adjustment to policy might be indicated. Now, the Governing Council spends a lot of time debating and forming judgments around these risks. So what I thought would be interesting would be to invite you inside our forecasting tent today and talk about how we've been seeing Canada's key economic risks evolve since our last NPR, which was back in April. Now, for the past 18 months, the biggest issue for our forecast has been tracking how the Canadian economy has been adjusting to low resource prices. Now, I don't have to remind you what that feels like. Now, in the first instance, this has meant a big drop in investment spending, especially in the oil patch. It's also meant a lower value for the Canadian dollar, and it has meant two interest rate cuts during 2015. Now, our forecast in April saw the Canadian economy making its way back to full capacity during 2016 and 2017, a process that would see inflation sustainably on our target of 2% by late next year. Without last year's interest rate cuts, this process would have taken much longer to have inflation get back to target. Now, while the April projection was being developed, the Canadian economy seemed to be doing better than previously expected. But our analysis suggested that we should not extrapolate that first quarter surge in growth for the rest of the year. Some of the apparent strength seemed to represent a catch-up from a soft fourth quarter, and some other factors were probably temporary. Accordingly, our April forecast anticipated a significant slowdown in growth for the second quarter, and then a decent pickup in the second half of this year, partly, of course, due to the government's new fiscal plan. Several risks played an important role in those discussions, and I'm now going to discuss four of the most important and consider how the economic data have supported our judgments since April. So we might as well start with the most obvious risk, and that's the outlook for the U.S. economy, which of course feeds directly into our recovery narrative for Canada's non-resource economy. So when we were preparing our forecast in April, the U.S. economy was showing signs of faster growth, but we were skeptical that it would be sustained. The fact is, we'd been disappointed too many times in the past. And as in all such debates, however, there was a risk that we were just being too conservative and would be surprised on the upside as things unfolded. That would have been welcome, by the way, because it would have been meant more exports for Canada. But as it turned out, the first quarter in the U.S. was even softer than we had been expecting. U.S. energy companies were cutting back on investment, much as energy companies were doing here in Canada, and U.S. consumers slowed the growth of their spending. But the second quarter has been looking better for the U.S. We're seeing renewed strength in housing and auto sales. Consumer confidence is near a post-crisis high. America's job market stumbled in the latest monthly report, but we don't think this one month of data heralds a significant downshift. Besides, some moderation in monthly employment gains and GDP growth is inevitable as the U.S. economy approaches full employment. 
So after tilting a little to the downside early in the year, the balance of risks around the U.S. outlook now appears to be reasonably close to our view in April. Now, a full re reassessment of this risk is being done right now because the next NPR will be in July, about a month from now. Now, generally speaking, a stronger U.S. economy will mean more export sales for Canada. But in recent years, this link has proved to be less reliable than in the past. Accordingly, the second forecast risk that has been really preoccupying us is the possibility that our Canadian export forecast would again miss the mark. Now, toward the end of 2015 and early 2016, in fact, non-energy exports started to show a lot of extra strength. Now, surprising to us, but at the same time, of course, encouraging. But more granular analysis suggested to us that some of that strength would be temporary. Auto exports, for example. And we judged that exports, therefore, would slow as we came through into the springtime. So the risk that we set out in the NPR was that we may have been a little too conservative on the export outlook. Maybe we'd get lucky and get surprised on the upside, uh, like we saw earlier in the winter. But sure enough, exports took a step back in the past couple of months, validating our cautious analysis. Even so, the levels of several export categories, despite those declines, have shown really good progress. So for example, exports of building and packaging materials are up 35% since 2012. They're back to levels last seen before the financial crisis. Furniture and fixtures exports are up 45% over the same period. And exports of pharmaceutical and medical medicinal products have grown by 70%. And then there's tourism. Now, I know the Yukon government has been actively working to draw in visitors, and look, here we are, uh, both from Canada and abroad. Land border crossings, and that's how I think the large share of your visitors entered the Yukon, are up almost 9% from last year. Accommodation and food services jobs are up about 15% in March from a year ago. So these trends are being replicated in many parts of Canada, tourism. Data on day trips between Canada and the US where people cross the border but don't stay overnight have shifted sharply. Many more Americans are crossing the border to shop in Canada, and many fewer Canadians are traveling in the opposite direction. Now, given the past depreciation of the currency and our confidence in the US expansion, we expect our export sector to continue to heal. Many firms in the export sector are close to their capacity limits, and this augurs well for future investment spending and job creation. So while this whole process has been disappointingly slow and uneven, we remain confident that we have the right narrative. Now the third big source of uncertainty in our forecast is how the economy will ultimately adjust to a world of significantly lower oil prices. Now, this basically comes down to the actions of individual firms and their investment plans. And we've managed to track it pretty well through the conversations with the firms themselves. In the energy sector, investment spending this year is expected to be about 60, 60 percent below 2014 levels. And before all that happened, they were spending one-third of all the investment spending in Canada. Now, since that process began, companies have cut investment spending each quarter by a bit more than we expected based on these conversations. So in our NPR, we framed this as one of our downside risks. And we've seen a similar phenomenon here in Yukon, as mineral exploration spending has fallen and is expected to drop further and several mines have closed in recent years. This includes plans for a temporary shutdown at the Minto copper mine next year. Well, the recent uptick in oil prices might lead some to expect an end to these investment cuts. But we're not persuaded of this for two reasons. The first is that some of the recovery in oil prices is due to supply disruptions that will probably be temporary. So we should reserve judgment on that. But the more important reason, though, 
is that it's highly uncertain what price level will rebalance the oil market on a sustained basis. It certainly looks to me as though prices will not be returning to their old highs in the foreseeable future. Oil companies and their suppliers and service providers have found many ways to cut costs through this. And this is lowering break-even prices. And that means that new oil supply can come back on stream profitably, especially in the U.S., in the shale plays, at lower prices than before. And that could put a lid on further price increases. So the recent pickup in oil prices is, of course, welcome, because it means a boost to Canadian income for every barrel that's exported. But an extended period of oil prices at recent levels is unlikely to lead to greater investment spending in the Canadian oil patch. Indeed, market intelligence suggests that there is further downside risk to investment at these still low price levels. Accordingly, this remains a potential source of downside risk for our forecast. So on to the fourth risk. The fourth risk that we've been giving special attention to is the possibility that Canadian households might become more cautious in their spending. Now, at the heart of this uncertainty is the high level of household debt that I mentioned before. Now, it's natural to expect that at some point, households will rein in their spending and put more effort into paying down their debt. But there's no evidence of this downside risk so far. Indeed, data from the first quarter show that household spending, including big ticket items like motor vehicle sales and housing, has remained very strong. Nevertheless, we'll have to remain alert for signs that this risk is emerging. Low interest rates and a resilient job market have certainly helped to sustain consumer spending. And the tax rate changes that the government introduced at the beginning of the year may also be playing a role. We also think spending is being supported by the impact of cheaper gasoline. Since the average Canadian household is spending about $600 less per year to fill their tank. But on the other side of this ledger, the decline in the Canadian dollar has raised the price of a wide range of imports. So a strong consumer is, of course, a key contributor to Canada's strong housing market, but a number of other factors are at play, as seen in the significant regional divergences in housing sales and prices. We continue to see extraordinarily strong markets in BC and Ontario fueled by strong population and employment growth, declines in energy-producing regions such as the prairies, and we see modest growth in housing elsewhere in the country. Indeed, we noted last week in our financial system review uh, that house prices in Vancouver and Toronto have been rising at a pace that probably cannot be sustained. Now, it's possible that self-reinforcing expectations of higher prices are affecting these markets. And the risk of a decline in prices, while difficult to quantify, is growing. So, after looking at those four risks, then where do we stand? Well, I have no doubt that the growth forecast numbers will change when we do our full analysis in July. And that will have implications for our projection of inflation and our policy deliberations. But it does seem that our core forecast narratives around the U.S. economy and around Canada's exports remain intact. Investment plans in the energy sector and the possibility that households will suddenly rein in spending to pay down debt, well, they still present downside risks that we'll continue to monitor very carefully. And of course, there may be a whole new set of risks to consider in July. Now, unfortunately, there's still one major economic factor to consider that was not foreseen at all and that's the Alberta wildfires. And these fires were brutal, as we well know. Something like 90,000 people displaced, 2,400 buildings, mostly homes, destroyed. And Canadians rallied to support their neighbours, as you'd expect. Insurance claims are expected to be somewhere between two and six billion dollars. That's the largest such event in Canadian history. Now, it's difficult to estimate the impact of this disaster on the Canadian economy. Lost oil output amounts to around a million barrels per day. 
but since it's unclear when production will be fully restored, the cumulative loss of income still is a bit uncertain. In addition, the vast majority of the local population wasn't working during the evacuation. So from a GDP standpoint, there will be some offsets to these losses from emergency services and that sort of thing. But to sum it all up, we estimate that the Alberta fires will reduce annualized growth in the second quarter by one to one and a quarter percentage points, which is a pretty big impact. Now, part of this decline in GDP stemming from the oil production shortfall will probably be made back sometime in the third quarter. The net effect on the level of GDP over time will depend on the pace of rebuilding, which at present is very difficult to foresee. So this suggests to us that GDP growth will be very choppy in the near term, in the second and the third quarters. The growth will probably be flat or slightly negative in the second quarter. And then we'll show an outsized recovery in the third quarter. And that type of quarterly growth profile could yield average growth over the two quarters, reasonably close to that set out in the bank's forecast in April. But we'll have to wait and see. We'll bring out a completely new analysis to the table in July, so all these estimates are subject to change based on these risks or new ones. And just by way of illustration, the outcome of the Brexit referendum, which is next week, poses new risks at the global level that could mean a shift in our views. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to conclude. And as I said at the beginning, the economic situation that we face is very complicated and is riddled with uncertainty. But I'm confident that we are making real progress. The global economy retains the capacity to disappoint us, but it's gradually healing. The US economy appears to be doing well, despite the usual variability in the data. Our export recovery is proving to be very uneven, but several categories are encouraging. Many export sectors are operating near their capacity limits, which augurs well for future investment and job creation. And the structural adjustments to low oil and other commodity prices are clearly underway, and they'll persist for some time yet. Financial stability risks, especially in the household sector, remain an area of concern. But these also should diminish as the economy strengthens. So continued patience is required, but we have the right to be optimistic. Let me acknowledge, though, that many of the macroeconomic processes that economists talk about sound impersonal, even mechanical. But I know they're not. Companies are run by real people. They risk real money in the creating jobs and economic growth. Hesitating to do this in the face of uncertainty is only human. Workers who lose their jobs as a result of low oil prices or other commodity prices may need to contemplate moving to another part of Canada. And layering the Alberta wildfires on top only increases the human burden. Economic adjustment processes that seem so ordinary in our models are painful, they're costly, and they take time at the human level. Still, there's a resilience and flexibility among Canadians that gives me confidence that we'll get through these adjustments and our economy will return to natural, self-sustaining growth. My message today is that the process has been uneven and probably will remain so, but we are making real progress. And rest assured that the Bank of Canada will keep doing its part to support Canadian workers and businesses along the way. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Governor Polis. Uh, the Governor has agreed to take a few questions from the floor, and uh, I think we have a couple of mics running around. Rachel and uh, Mel may have mics, so just put up your hand if you want to ask a question, and they'll bring a mic to you. And maybe I could uh, commence with one. Um, you talked about the, uh, the, the, the consumer spending and its impact, and we're starting to hear a lot of people talking about this unprecedented uh, generational wealth transfer that's going to go on and speculation that that might cause 
some money in the economy to, to increase its velocity and so forth. Is that a factor you're considering? Well, here you point to something which is a fact, that's for sure, um, that uh, demographics figure very prominently in our, in our understanding of how things are evolving. So in particular, we've had about 50 years of unusually fast growth in the labor force and therefore in the economic growth, in the potential growth of the economy and actual growth. Um, that's our generation. Okay, that's the baby boom generation. And that 50 years uh, has been a good run, but what's happening is those folks are entering the retirement window. And as that happens, the economy, and not just in Canada, but the economy everywhere, is gradually slowing down to a new long-term growth rate. Uh, for Canada, for example, we estimate it's going to slow down to around 1.5% as the steady state long-term growth rate as we go through this transition. And the only way to change that would be to have, well, more people. Uh, oh, there's one other way, and that is to have some wild and crazy inventions that increase our productivity uh, suddenly. And uh, of course, all that is possible. Uh, but in that context, of course, you're right that over the next 20 years or 30 years, uh, I would say, in that window, there will be a large transfer of wealth from today's current generation, ourselves, and to our kids. And, um, and so a lot of uh, wealth has been accumulated in that, uh, in that uh, biggest business cycle of our times. Um, analyzing that is very hard to do. It's something that's not going to happen suddenly. It's going to be a very gradual process. But I suspect that it does influence uh, younger people today uh, in the way they behave around uh, borrowing because they, they know that someday, possibly in a long time, hopefully a long time from now, they will get some money from mom and dad. Now, maybe not a lot of money, but some money. And that's the sort of thing that allows them to plan uh, slightly differently than how I think how we did. So, um, but that's, that's not something we can put into our models per se. It's just sort of like it may influence judgment and our understanding of how the credit process evolves. That was a good question, Rich. That's a good one. Yeah, um, Governor Polos, uh, we've had very low interest rates for, I think, eight years, uh, near zero. Uh, a generation ago, we had very high interest rates, and then we had very high growth. We had 3 to 5% growth. We've got very low growth. We've got very low interest rates. When can interest rates be normalized so that business can go back to normal? So that's a, that's a very complicated question. Next question. <laughs> no, no, seriously, next question. I'm just kidding, uh, but I'll go back to that. Um, so those things are intimately related. So uh, when I talked about the slowdown in the long-term growth rate in the economy, that's being driven by our capacity, or our capability to produce growth. And that comes, that slowdown comes from a slowdown in labor force growth, which is happening because we're aging. Uh, so what that does is it changes the long-term equilibrium of the economy, and it feeds directly into the long-term equilibrium rate of interest. And that's one of the reasons why interest rates are going to be lower than we ever believed before for a very long time. I'm not saying they're going to be zero or anything like that. But when we do get home, and everything's back to normal, as you described. Interest rates will certainly be higher than they are today, but they will be much lower than we got used to in the past because of that slower trend growth line. But in this window where we find ourselves now, there's a bigger cyclical reason, and that is that many of the things that were, that were present in the wake of the global financial crisis uh, are still there. Now, in 2008, the G20 countries got together and they all together eased fiscal policy and monetary policy in order to prevent what I consider to be the, the second Great Depression. All the ingredients were present for us to go through today another depression like the one in the 30s. But we prevented that with well done policy making. But many of those forces are still acting. Now, that means, therefore, that monetary policy is not doing nothing right now. It's actually preventing that rock from rolling down the hill 
on top of us. Um, and if you're, not, if you're unconvinced by that, just ask yourself what might happen to the economy if we simply returned interest rates to 3 or 4 percent tomorrow, what would that do? Most people would immediately react and say, well, that would cause a recession, given where we're starting. And they'd be right. And what that tells you is that low interest rates today are helping to prevent exactly that. So it's countering a headwind or a force that has not yet gone away. And this is why that healing process that I talked about at the global level is proving to be so gradual and not even in a straight line. A couple steps forward and then a step back. So um, this, is, this is all proving longer no, than anyone could have expected back in 2008 or 10. We never would have guessed that this would still be the case today. And so policy is dealing with that and will continue to do so until those forces actually dissipate. Now, as we see them, they are dissipating, and this is why we believe that Canada, over the next, say, 18 months or so, can close its excess capacity gap and get back much closer to normal. But we have to get all, that, all those chain reaction things going, the natural sequence going, before we're confident that it's all going to happen by itself. Policy needs to continue to nurture it uh, for some time yet. Questions? Yeah. Um, in your first two responses to questions, you talked about more of the long-term issues, and I wanted to ask you uh, how uh, the Bank of Canada works with <coughs> the environment. How do you see the economy and the environment working together, and, and how does that play into your long-term modeling and forecasting? Well, at, at this stage, this is uh, this is rather a developmental area, let's say, in our, in our forecasting and our understanding of the economy. There are changes uh, that are underway, uh, which, uh, which we can point to, which are obviously affecting economic behavior. And there are policy changes on their way, uh, in various forms, which will also affect the economy. So for us, it's more a matter of waiting to see how those things unfold and incorporating them as they come along. Um, one of, the, one of the things that that uh, suggests is that if you were to uh, have breakthroughs uh, in climate technologies, you may be able to improve the long-term growth rate in the economy uh, above that 1.5% number I mentioned before. That's the kind of innovation which I think uh, is possible, and that's where there's so much R&D going now. We can't really predict where those kinds of innovations might take us. So at this stage, what we do is we admit that we're uncertain about many of these things, and we use ranges uh, to depict uh, how the economy is performing somewhere between here and there. And then our job as policymakers is to weigh the upside and the downside risks, including things like you're mentioning, and decide if our policy will make a bigger mistake by doing this as opposed to that. So it's a risk management problem that we that we, or lens that we bring to that issue. And uh, so for us, of course, since we, where we've been has us highly preoccupied with downside risks, because if we had some upside risks, we'd just be, love to see them happen, right? Because the economy is still struggling to get out of that, that uh, sluggish phase. Uh, downside risks seem much more important at this stage. So I know that's a long answer, and I, I didn't say much about climate, and that's because it's, it's new, and it's gradually being captured, but it'll be more uh, as changes occur that they'll get incorporated in our models. Here's a question right up the front. Oh, sorry, okay. I can't see very well. And then Mayor, we'll come back to you. Um, yeah, Governor, it's uh, Mark Wedge, and I'm just wondering, you know, there's a lot more access to capital for First Nations, and there's a lot more involvement in economic enterprises with First Nations. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts or how that may enter into some of your perceptions and views. Well, um, it's true. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the things we concern ourselves with at this stage of the, of the long, slow business cycle is will there be sufficient access to capital for young companies, uh, which will be our growth stories in the new in the new phase. Uh, talked about this in, on other, other occasions. And uh, in a world in which there's so much uncertainty and frankly where we have we've put a bunch more regulations into the financial sector in order to 
correct some of the imbalances that we detected in the last financial crisis. In that context, we are concerned that there won't be sufficient capital and therefore growth will be one of the reasons why growth will be slow to get out of the gates. Because growth doesn't come out of thin air really, it comes from a new company or a young company that creates it. And that's also where the new productivity and the new jobs come from. So that process will be very important to us over the next two years. So it's, it's great to hear that in, in certain areas of the economy, credit's not a constraint and that allows great ideas to come to fruit unhindered. Uh, because I can assure you that unless we get that process up and running, we won't get back to that normal self-sustaining growth that I talked about. Um, now, just one last data point before I leave that question. So before the crisis, we were growing the population of companies in Canada at about a 3% annual rate. And we were growing between 2 and 3% GDP, but we had more 3% more companies each year. Obviously, some companies uh, ceased to exist, but there were enough new ones to replace them and still grow. Right now, we're only growing at about 1% population of companies. But if we look to the U.S., they had the same thing, around 3% below before the crisis. They lost a lot of companies during the Great Recession. They've re gradually recovered, and now, today, they are back to the 3% growth rate for the population of companies. And this is where the next phase of growth and productivity will come from, and new jobs. So we are, we are behind them in that say a year or perhaps two years. That's part of that process that I talked about. And so the more that First Nations are part of that process, the better I like it. Mayor Chris. Thank you and welcome Governor to you Thank and your directors. It's wonderful to have you here in our city. Um, the question I had is, is, well full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the announcement made by Canada to put more money into uh, infrastructure, in particular for municipal governments and First Nations. And I know that all municipal governments across Canada and First Nation governments are, are really feeling the pain for infrastructure. And I just wanted to get your perspective on how that may help the, the business community as well as individuals in terms of uh, moving forward and implementing that infrastructure projects as soon as possible. Right. So um, virtually all of the, uh, the talk I've heard around the infrastructure file has been what I would call growth facilitating infrastructure. So it's, it's any, anything that a company needs as part of its operations, you know, if, if, if it needs, uh, you know, a better road to get its product to its big customers, or if it needs a better airport or an improvement to the airport uh, because it ships that way, Whatever it is, it's, or if it's education because it has trouble recruiting the right uh, workers to grow its business. Uh, those, those are what I call growth facilitators, those investments. And so, uh, yes, when I say uh, the economy is likely to slow down to around 1.5% for its long-term growth rate, uh, I'm abstracting from the kinds of things that we could do to enhance that growth rate. Things like infrastructure investment that that allow companies to grow faster, that's a great ingredient. So that's the place I put it in my model. But a lot of other things fit in there too, such as free trade agreements, international ones, and interprovincial ones, okay? Those are the kinds of things, the impediments that business hits, those are growth impediments. And the lower our growth rate becomes, the more important those things are gonna to seem to us. So some of the investments could be, like you say, infrastructure, better transportation, better telecoms, better education, all those kinds of things. Uh, it could also be investment in uh, dismantling some of the things that slow growth down. And that's kind of a political investment, isn't it? It's where we have to really do the kind of hard negotiating to, to make those things uh, go away. So um, I, I'm optimistic that we have a lot of opportunities to do better on these, and infrastructure is a key ingredient to that, provided it is truly growth facilitating. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Danny, I see you signaling to the mic there. Governor, thank, thank you, and I, I guess my question builds on what the mayor had to ask, but in, in a different context. We're in a situation, and how do you consider in your modeling the infrastructure deficit that we have in this country? We just had a meeting with 
the city of Whitehorse last night and and many municipalities are in the same boat that they're not accounting and there aren't the adequate reserves there and we say well part of the solution is we're going to go to the territorial government for the money or the territorial government's going to go to the federal government for the money and that's all our money so at some point in time those taxes how does your modeling look at the massive undeniable infrastructure deficit we have in the country that we all seem to be somewhat ignoring right so so um this, this, I hope this doesn't sound unscientific to you, but I can assure you it is scientific, but it's the state of the art. So what we do is we analyze the growth trend in the economy that, that we can't otherwise explain. And that growth trend is the stuff like innovation, and it would capture those kinds of deficiencies. So that growth trend would be a number that would be a little higher if we didn't have infrastructure uh, shortfalls. And so that growth trend is, is in, the, in, the, in the very middle of our model, but it's driven by the data. We don't uh, pretend to be able to forecast it. It's driven by the performance of the economy. And it's usually very slow moving. So that means if you do make good investments in infrastructure and help, help reduce that uh, infrastructure deficit, that that trend line can gradually make its way up by 0.1 or 0.2. And believe me, 0.1 or 0.2 doesn't sound like much, but when you're looking at 1.5 and it can become 1.7, then you just measure that for 10 years. You start to have some real, real progress. And so those kinds of things are very worth doing, and that's where it fits into our model. And it means then that the capacity of the economy is growing faster than before. And that allows us to have more time of non-inflationary growth, creating new jobs, okay, creating uh, new companies and new jobs, and making that progress real. So if the, if the infrastructure is not there, then we, then we kind of have a, a barrier to that growth, something that doesn't facilitate as much. So hopefully that gives you the intuition about where it fits. And uh, it's not like we can plug things in, like, you know, this infrastructure project gets plugged into the model and there, we, voila, we have the answer. It's more of a long-term, very sluggish trend uh, that we watch uh, with care uh, on, a, on, a, on a continuous basis. I assure you, it will, it will have the positive effects. They may be hard to measure at first, but over time, uh, they will work. Just as it worked, if we go back to history, the 1950s and 1960s, were huge government investment years. Uh, after, the, after the war was over, a lot of people were worried we would slip back into the Great Depression. And we didn't. And the reason we didn't was because fiscal action was very strong. It was heavy on education and heavy on transportation infrastructure. And that facilitated those 20 years of great growth that you know, many of us were kids then. And, and uh, much of that infrastructure is, we're still using it, right? So those investments have paid off very big. The other thing about that is infrastructure pays for itself in the sense that it creates new growth. That creates revenues for governments all over the place. So it, it is an investment, not spending. We should think of it that way. Okay, I don't see any more questions out there. So uh, please join me with, uh, oh, do we have one more? One more question? Okay. We have just a couple minutes left, and then yeah. uh, he okay. has the press conference in okay. the other room there. Okay, we'll make this the last question. Thanks, Rich, and thanks, Governor. Um, I just have a quick question about uh, risk and just responsible risk taking. I'm just wondering from where Canada was and where we are now, and where we are compared to other countries in the world, um, if you feel that. Um, Canada's taking enough risks, um, you know, both from the private sector and public sector. Well, that's uh, where you're going to end off on one of the deepest questions of the day, uh, almost philosophical. Um, now, people have, have, have said it uh, looks like uh, people are taking a lot of risk in financial markets, searching for yield and you know, buying ever riskier assets to get a higher yield in their portfolio. And yet, in the real economy, companies are not taking enough risk to grow the economy. And I think that's what's at, maybe at the root of your question. And, uh, and if, if any place would suffer from that, I suppose it could be Canada. But I don't believe it, actually. Uh, when I talk to companies, and I talk to a lot of them, 
Uh, they're looking around themselves. They're, 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 they're feeling lucky to still be here, given what we've been through. And it's not just luck, of course, it's hard work. They, they may be downsized, they really crunch things, they, they, they ran their business really carefully, and they got through it, and now we expect them just to wake up in the morning and spend all their hard-earned money to, to grow, their, grow their company. And they read in the newspaper just before breakfast all the things that could go wrong next week. And so with that, in that zone of uncertainty, people are quite naturally reluctant to simply go out and, and invest, take new risks, um, when in fact they're taking risk just keeping their business running when so many things seem to be going wrong every time we open up the newspaper. So I maintain that in the real economy, people are taking a lot of risk by maintaining their companies, by maintaining the jobs that we do have, and I think they're getting closer and closer to feeling comfortable about moving on to the next phase and growing their business. Certainly the exporters that we talk to are saying, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm starting to disappoint clients. When they phone and they want more, I say, well, I, have to, I can't deliver for a while because I'm so busy. Well, that's the turning point where they may invest in more equipment, expand by 10% or what have you, hire a few more people, and then they grow their business. That's the phase of the expansion we're watching for. And we know they're close to being ready, and it's going to be just human nature. It's going to be when they're ready. And I think just normal day to daily life is risky enough without adding something else on until you're actually ready. So I've turned your question around on you, I think. Uh, I think there's plenty of risk taking going on. And uh, when the risk levels go down, they'll take what looks like more, but it'll just be normal business. Thank you very much for your questions.